left and Pedro and you know, cats, two of my pastors, and helped start. They, they passed away like months from each other, uh, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bill Smith, who's a long, long time friend, wonderful, uh, uplifting friend, he, he's gone. You know, we're just going to go, and, and it's okay. You know, we're, we're going to go, and no matter how we go, it's okay. Because we were never meant to live in these tents. These are just tents. And it says when this, uh, this body, this tent is destroyed, and the word destroyed means just to take down. Just like you put up a tent when you go camping, like, when I was camping with the boys and the Cub Scouts, we put up a tent, it would take a long time to put up a tent, finally get it together, brush it out, build a campfire, and then spend a couple days and tear the whole thing down. And uh, the way that God sees it, He already sees our tents taken down, and us with Him and our new bodies in the kingdom of heaven because He sees it all. And so that's what we have to look forward to. We have nothing wicked or dark to look forward to at all. No matter what we, the only thing that could freak us out is just our fear of passing or fear of other people passing but those who are the, the children of God were going from this kind of a shadow of life into the real life that's where we're heading so I, I know that I'm not afraid I know most of you aren't afraid but I, I do fear losing you know loved ones and if Sam went before me it'd break my heart just like if I you know, I'll go before her and we'll break her heart. So we will miss each other, but we'll all end up together. And, and contrary to the way that some people think about it, because it says in the scriptures that he will wipe away every tear and the former things will be remembered no more, I really believe that that pertains to certain elements about our, our own life. I don't think that we're going to have a memory of the, the uh, crawling through this life or anything like that. But I think we'll recognize each other. I think we'll, we'll know each other. And one thing that I think that we'll always remember is that Jesus did for us upon the cross. And that will never be like away because it even says that he'll be wearing the scars. And I don't know if that literally means that for the rest of eternity, uh, Christ the Lord, the, the, the creator and the sustainer of the universe is going to have a physical body with scars that it's going to remember. But I think that it is going to be deeply burned and embedded into the hearts of all God's people what Christ did. Otherwise, what would the lessons be? If, if man fell and uh, God redeemed us and we never remembered it, then what was what was it for? Was it just an accident? No, I think that God had a plan in it all just making us better than we would have been if Adam had never fallen. That's my take now. I could be a heretic and that's okay. God forgives me. Romans 4, verse 9 through 16. Last week we went through verses 1 through 8 where we looked at the ancient Jews and ancient Gentiles and their attempts to please and appease their gods. Naturally, the, uh, the God of Israel, um, the people of Israel trying to appease their God through the works of the law and obey, obey the law. But as we know, no one can truly obey the law because we have fallen DNA, we have fallen hearts, and we will always sin, and that always separates us from God. And that's why God had to have a plan that went way beyond the, the law of Moses and people trying to obey the Mosaic law in order to become righteous enough to once again have that complete fellowship with God. And using Abraham, we saw last week, the patriarch of the nation of Israel as a prime example of faith, Paul asked in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, he said, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found uh, according to the flesh. And if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, this, just this one area of the, the, uh, the book of Romans really sets the foundation for everything else that we're going to build upon, and that is this, is that Abraham was the the father of the promises of God and the blessing of God. And it was through his seed that the Messiah would come. But before the Messiah would come, it was also through his seed that the law would be given. And so we always look at Abraham and we see him as kind of a father of legalism, the father of laws and rules and regulation. But he himself was considered righteous by God because he believed God. He had faith in God. 
that sets the whole precedent, sets the whole foundation for what the new covenant is all about, and the revelation of the new covenant is all about. And that is, once again, we're going to hear it over and over and over again, is the law cannot make you righteous. The law is righteous in and of itself, but it can't make you righteous because you can't be good enough to obey the law. And then the other side of that is that by grace through faith, we become righteous when we believe upon the Son of God, which is the new covenant. It's as simple as that. And when people try to complex, make it more complex and introduce all these new rules and regulations for us, they are just basically throwing out a load on your shoulders, the shoulders of your heart. And that's why a lot of people can't walk the Christian walk and they think it's too hard because they're carrying a load that they're not supposed to be carrying. They're carrying the law. They're carrying even Christian law upon the shoulders that God never intended us to have. So Abraham was accounted by God to be righteous, but it was never because of Abraham's works. It says in verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It didn't, doesn't mean that he earned it. It doesn't mean that he did anything to deserve it. It was accounted to him by God. Just as if Abraham was poor and he had, still had a bank account, but there was nothing in it. And God said, okay, Abraham, if you just believe me, I'm going to fill your, your account. I'm going to put money in your account that you can live on for the rest of your days. And in fact, I'm going to make it so that all your people, from generation after generation, should be able to draw from that same account if they will just have the same relationship with me as you do. So Abraham was righteous because he believed God. He had faith in God. That's what it means to believe in him. And therefore followed God. When, you know, when you believe in someone, you believe in their leadership. If you say you believe it, but you don't follow them, it means that you don't believe it. But if you say you believe in someone and you follow them, your actions prove out what you say you believe. So Abraham was righteous because he believed God and faith in God and therefore followed God and wherever God led him, he would follow him. It says now in verse 4, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. Somebody who is working for something, they, they earn a certain amount of pay for the work that they do. If you're following the law, you, you earn certain merits for the laws that you, you uh, accomplish or that you obey. But he who works, the wages are not come out of his grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So he's saying, okay, so you can go out and work all that you want. You can try to save all the money that you want, but there'll never be enough to buy what you need. You'll never be able to be payment enough for your soul, and for the salvation of your soul, the redemption of your soul, the cleansing of your soul, and so that God does, will not pour his righteous indignation upon your blood, basically. If we have a relationship with God according to works, it's like trying to put God in debt to us. You know, we do a lot for God, we serve God, we maybe work in the children's ministry or we work in the ministry and go out and we feed the poor and we say to God, okay, God, why is my life not going so well? I did all this stuff. And God says to you, well, why did you do that stuff? Well, you, well, God, I, I figured if I did this that you would bless me. He goes, when did you ever hear that? You ever told you that? Where does it say that in my scripture? And that's the truth of the matter is, is that God gives us everything he gives us out of his grace and love for us. And that's why sometimes you see people that you think would never deserve anything, they're getting all kinds of things. Have you ever seen people prosper and you just go, that guy's a jerk. Why, why are you blessing him? I'm much better than he is. And look, what, look what's happening with him. But God chooses to bless some with things that are financial or things that are monetary and others he doesn't. I know that for me, he's held back a lot. I did a lot better when I was in the world. I was, I was wealthy in the world. I grew up in a wealthy family. I left home. I was a drug dealer. I became a wealthy drug dealer. I did really well. I, I mean, I could buy anything I wanted. Become a Christian, I'm, I'm pushing a lawnmower, digging ditches, turning over soil, you know? And I just thought, wow, is this the way it works out? Okay, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, I'm doing it. You know, and, and then yet, for years, there was a part of me that said, look, God, I'm humble. I'm willing to, to live with nothing. I drive a funky old car, which rarely works. 
Surely you're going to reward me now for my humility. And God goes, no, that's not the deal. <laughs> yes, in fact, and I would have, if I would have known what he was going to do for the next 45 years, I probably would have become a Buddhist. You know, he just withheld things from me. Now, my dad withheld things from me. I was thinking about this today. Uh, he withheld things from me because he thought that if he gave me things, that he would make me weak. That was always what he told me. So he gave my sisters everything. They, 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 they got uh, jewelry and money and a college education. I had to work my way through everything. Because he said, if I give it to you, you're going to be a weak man. So he held it back. Seems like God carried out what my dad started. <laughs> and, and, and he just, no matter what I did, he tried to get ahead and, and make money or make a fortune so I could float on it with a big bank account. I just did not do it. And it wasn't that I wasn't savvy enough. I know how to do things. I, I know how to do business. You know, I'm just as, I can be just as shrewd and funny as any businessman. But God said, I don't want you to do that. Took everything. You know, I was a martial artist most of my life. And he took it that away. He said to me one day, he said, do you want to be a healer or a murderer? It's like, take your pick. But if I had picked one, he'd be ashamed of me. Same thing with my dad. When I was turning 13, he said, son, what do you want for your 13th birthday? I said, a 10-speed bike. He said, okay, son, I'll tell you what. I'll either give you a 10-speed bike or I'll give you golf lessons. He says, if you take the 10-speed bike, it'll show you're still a child. If you take the golf lessons, it'll show you're growing into a man. So I took golf lessons. Same thing with God. God puts me in this place where now I just have to kind of do what he has me to do, but I, I don't regret it one bit. Because everything that uh, God has made me that is, is serviceable to you and to the body of Christ and to everyone else comes from that constant withholding and the constant breaking, the constant allowance of, of hellfire sometimes uh, that happens in my life. Like being uh, uh, misunderstood or, or misjudged for things that I never did. All that stuff plays a part in making me lesser. And I need to be lesser so that he can become more. So I'm always saying, God, use me, use me, use me. He goes, okay, in order for me to use you, I, have, I might have to kill you. <laughs> and, and he didn't, I don't mean it literally, but I'm going to have to let you die. I'm going to let, you know, let that ego die. So a lot of person that you think you are, that you want to be, is going to die. And that's what he does. So now, you know, the years have passed, and I, I look back, and I'm glad. I really am. I'm glad because if I had taken any of those other roads, if I had gotten the success that I strove for, if I had allowed myself to, for uh, someone to make me famous when I was uh, a younger musician, which happened uh, several times, uh, then I probably would have been a lot less hungry for the Lord and, and, uh, and burning for revival as I am now. Because that's all, all that's in my heart. It's just a hunger for God, a burning for revival, a, a love of his people and a love of him, naturally a love of him. And that dwarfs and uh, is more magnified than anything else in my life because there's nothing else that I have. There's nothing else that I, I can live for because God never gave it to me. He didn't give me the great, you know, place, you know, some wonderful uh, relaxing lifestyle. It's like I'm just always going. Sometimes I say, God, isn't it, isn't it time that I'm tired? a little old now for this. You know, and he goes, no, you can do it. I'll do this right. Okay? Just pick up that shelf. You can do it. You, know, you, you have thick calluses on your hand for a reason, my son. <laughs> and I'm just going to keep you going. There. And it's good. It really is a good thing. But getting back to, to uh, if you have a relationship with God according to works, it's like trying to put God in debt. It's like trying to say, if I do something for you, then you have to do something for me. I am good enough and righteous enough to deserve the blessings of God and heaven when I die. But Paul wanted to bring the revelation that the just shall live by faith. If you want to be justified, if you want to be made righteous, if you want to be made holy, if you want to be a child of the Most High God and inherit the promises of God, then you will do that by receiving God's grace appropriated through faith. And faith, it doesn't even take much faith. It's just enough faith to put your hand out and say, I believe that if I put my hand out, you're going to fill it. And oftentimes, people won't even do that. Just as David also, in verse 6, describes the blessedness of a man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. 
So blessed are these whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So blessed are we when God no longer holds us accountable for our sins, even though we should be held accountable. So that brings us to our, at the beginning of our text, uh, our verse tonight, it's verse 9, it says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, the, the um, children of Israel, or upon the uncircumcised also, the Gentiles? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham the righteousness, Abraham being the father of the circumcision, or of the Jews. How does that now fit into God's plan for the Gentiles? How then was it accounted, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So the first thing he points out, verse 10, is that all the, the promises of God, the blessing of God, and, and uh, Abraham becoming righteous, or being accounted for righteousness, came before there was any circumcision, before there was any Mosaic law. God has laid the foundation, taking us back to the very beginning, of the promises to Abraham, saying the same way that Abraham received righteousness is the same way that you will receive righteousness now. You receive righteousness not by being a legalist and obeying uh, laws, but you receive righteousness when you are a friend of God, when you love God, when you are attracted to God, when you want to draw near to your creator. That's the goal. The goal is to get closer to Jesus Christ closer to God through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. He answers the question himself. So here's Abraham, he's uncircumcised. He hasn't inherited any anything other than a relationship with God. Because of that relationship, God had given him the promises of all nations being blessed through his seed and the number of countless number of people that have come through him. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. He received the sign of circumcision, everything that would come with being a chosen person, a chosen soul for the kingdom of heaven, which is what circumcised circumcision is supposed to um, illustrate is anyone that was circumcised was a child of God, was a person given over to Jehovah. And so here is Abraham with Jehovah, uncircumcised, but still has the sign of circumcision, which is what? A heart that is given over. A heart that is yielded and sanctified over to God because he believed in God and he trusted in God. That he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, but righteousness might be imputed to them also. So now we see it, how we fit in. We're, we are Gentiles. Gentiles at the time were uncircumcised, and it wouldn't matter if you were circumcised or uncircumcised. That's a thing of the flesh. But the Gentiles now are fit into the plan, and God even shows from the very beginning that he had always intended to, to give his grace also to those that were outside the covenant that he gave to Abraham. And that is because Abraham was not only the father of Israel, he is the father of faith. He is the first that God used as an example of people being saved by grace through faith. And you and I, therefore, are spiritual children of Abraham because we have become believers. We have become, in effect, circumcised or set apart or uh, made holy because of the very same thing that made Abraham holy. It is now accounted us, for us to be righteous and holy because of what Jesus Christ did for us in the cross and our belief in what he did. So we believe God. We have faith in God. It's accounted to us for righteousness. Your righteousness doesn't come from your own good actions or good deeds or your obedience to any type of laws, whether they be uh, from the Mosaic law or even Christian laws in the Bible that you try to obey. It comes because you believe. Plain and simple. You are a child of God because you believe. No other reason. And God has has allowed you to believe by His grace. Think about that. You maybe may not have believed. But God gave you the ability to believe in Him. 
and see him, even through the, the cloudy mist of blindness that we have, as being fallen, a fallen race of people. He allowed you to see through the darkness and to him, no matter what you were doing, by his grace. And now through faith, by believing in what you saw, you now have redemption. You are now cleansed. You are now part of God's family. It's very, very simple and very, very blessed to hear. So, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So the Jews believed circumcision was necessary to become righteous, justified before God. That's something that would that was easy to understand how they could believe that because it came down uh, as a, a form of legalism, as law. Yet Abraham was counted as righteous and justified before he was circumcised, before the law of Moses even came to being or was revealed. Revealing that it wasn't physical circumcision that made Abraham righteous, but a circumcision of the heart, a heart that is set apart for God, a heart that believes God the sign of circumcision before having been circumcised is simply just faith in God, believing God. Circumcision was an outward sign or seal of what was supposed to have taken place in the heart of the person who was circumcised. If you were a Jew, you were supposedly dedicated to God, one of his chosen people. However, the act of circumcision itself justifies no one. You could go through the motion, you could try to uh, make sure that you were counted along with the rest of the nation by being circumcised, but you were still not circumcised. The cir circumcision was not an outward uh, act of um, surgery, but it was now the matter of the heart. If you were a Jew, you were supposed to be dedicated to God. In our Christian faith, we are commanded to be baptized in water, aren't we? It's a commandment of God. It's not something that is, is just a suggestion. We are commanded to do two things that God wants us to do to continue to do, and that is when you believe, be baptized in water, and then secondarily, remember the Lord's Supper. To do those two things, to take communion. Yet the water, when we go into it, never cleanses us. If you had gone in and you didn't really believe in God and you were baptized, it doesn't do a thing for you except to get you wet. We were made clean by our <coughs> faith in Christ, even before we were baptized. So from the time that you really believed in Jesus Christ, you were made clean. You were baptized in a certain extent by the Holy Spirit, coming into you, changing you, setting you apart. And then we are baptized in water as an outward sign or seal of what was supposed to have taken place in the heart of the person who is being baptized. So if it is faith which justifies us and makes us righteous before God, then circumcision cannot justify nor make one single soul righteous. This is why there's no need for anyone who converts to the faith of Christianity to be, to be circumcised, Jews or Gentiles. None of us need to go through that anymore because it's a done deal. It was something that was done as a type of learning process so we could know what the righteousness of God was, what the standards of his righteousness were, and know that we didn't meet them. And then the the grace of God comes in and goes, okay, all this, all these things you're guilty of, not maybe all of them, the commandments, but you're guilty of some, and that's enough to keep you from the kingdom of God. By my son's death and by my son's re resurrection, you will die to yourself and rise again as a new creation of Christ Jesus. That's that transformation. And we have risen spiritually, and we will rise again physically. So if you were to pass away before the Lord comes back, if there's no rapture before you pass away, you will go into your grave or be cremated or maybe decimated somehow. You know, maybe you uh, uh, get disintegrated. It doesn't matter. All your atoms, everything that you were, that's not you anyway. That's just your tail. Mm -hmm. But God can even take those molecules and bring them all back together in, in, in just a word and magnify them and transform them into something completely different. I don't know how it's going to work, but it doesn't matter to me. Just like my car has been sitting in my driveway now for a half a year at least. And I look at it, and I have a sign up that says not for sale. And, but I can't drive it because it's illegal for me to drive. But it's just there. And it's just an old car, and I don't care about it anymore. I'd like to get rid of it, but I can't sell it without 
smog you first, and I can't smog you without driving. I can't drive it because it's illegal. <laughs> so I just looked at it. Said, I'm going to make it into a statue. I'm just going to start painting it or something. It's great. And maybe that, uh, they were an eyesore. But anyway, our tenants, these bodies, are just going to go away. Just, uh, and when they do go away, God can do anything. He raise the dust. People are afraid of being cremated because they think, well, what God, how's God going to raise me up? How's he going to put all my particles back there? Well, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He did that. Can he do anything else? Huh. If, he, if he can, then don't worry about any of that. I don't think it matters. I, I tell people, throw me in a dumpster. <laughs> but we're made clean by faith in Christ, even before we're baptized. Therefore, baptism in water is the outward sign or seal of what was supposed to have taken place. It's only the hour of appearance. So if it is faith which justifies us and makes us righteous before God, then circumcision cannot justify or make us righteous. And this is why there's no need for us to go through any more of the legalism, any more of the laws. You know, you can use the law of Moses as a guideline, and I think that you should. I think you should know the Ten Commandments. I think that they're all valid and they're all they're all livable. You know, to not have any other gods before you. That's something that you should think about all the time. And remember what those things might be that come in between you and, and God. And right on down the list. But Christ has made us free. In Galatians 5, 1 through 6, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, liberty as opposed to legalism, by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And he's speaking absolutely about the law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I mean, circumcised won't do anything for you at all. In fact, if you keep going that way, then you're putting yourself under the law. And then if you're going to put yourself under the law, you have better obey the law. So Christ will profit you nothing, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. How does someone fall from grace? So they don't believe in grace. They believe in law. So you either believe that the law and obedience of the law can make you righteous, or you believe the covenant that says that by grace you are saved by faith. It's the gift of God. God so no one can boast about their salvation. For we through the whole Holy Spirit and the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Another thing worth mentioning is in verse 11 where Paul speaks of Abraham being the father of all who believe. It had to be greatly difficult for the Jewish Christians to accept the idea that Gentiles could ever call Abraham their father. Because they always looked down at the Gentiles. They said, we're the children of Abraham. You're not the children of Abraham. You came in just by the skin of your teeth. You're, an ado you're adopted. You know, it's kind of like a family where everyone else's biological is an adopted child. And they want to torment their adopted brother or sister. They go, you were adopted. And that's the way that people talked uh, that are possibly Jews that had converted to Christianity to people that were Gentiles. We have been raised to think of Gentiles as lesser and outside the faith of God to not be confronted with the truth that Gentiles can also be sons of Abraham, it would be just an absolutely huge adjustment. For the promise that he would be the heir to the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So that shows you right away that the promise to be, uh, the promise that he, Abraham, would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. In other words, it wasn't given to him through legalism, but it was through the fact that he had faith in God. That's why he was given the promise. Not because he obeyed any laws, but he was righteous in them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were given the promise of God through the righteousness of faith. I think about the story of Esau and Jacob in Genesis 25. Esau was born first and technically would inherit the promise and blessing of God through Isaac, their father. But Esau didn't believe, and Jacob did. Therefore, the promise and blessing of God was given to Jacob. Why? Because he believed. He believed, if I could just get this promise, 
I will become the heir to this promise that God has given my people. So he believed. He believed that even though he took the promise uh, kind of deceptively, to say the least, and it was uh, definitely something that um, people could really frown upon, if Esau had taken the promise, then perhaps the promise would have died at his taking up. But God had it already planned out. He had already given them a mom who, who favored him. You know, he had uh, given them a, a mom who favored him and talked to him into doing it. And so Jacob inherited the promises, and then the promises went on as planned. So Galatians 3, verses 7 through 14, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed, are of faith, are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is heaven, and the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. If we were trying to obey the law, we would be living under God's curse. And we would eventually come under the wrath of God. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He became not only a person that took a lot upon the curse, but he became the curse. For it has written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Come upon the Gentiles in Jesus Christ, uh, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through the faith. Verse 14, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made with no effect. If those trying to live according to the law are truly the heirs of God's promise, then the concept of faith no longer matters and a promise made of no function. The law can't bring us into God's promises, not because it is not good, but because no one can keep it. Verse 15, because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if you live according to the law, you'll suffer the, law, the wrath of God according to the law, because you can't keep the law. You don't have the power to keep the law, so if you want to be justified and be righteous by trying to live the law, you will fail and be found unrighteous and face the wrath of God. On the other hand, where there is no law, there is no transgression, meaning there is no transgression of the law. But there is sin regardless of whether you try to live according to the law or outside of the law. So if you never even heard the law, it doesn't matter. You're still in sin. Sin is just simply missing the mark. It's missing the relationship with God, which means trusting Him, relying on Him, and hearing Him. So we can see that God's plan of redemption for man is based on a faith in God and not willingness and willingness to trust and follow God, not trying to be, obey the rules of the law. Therefore, in verse 16, and this is our last verse, it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise may be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Ephesians 2, verse 49, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which, he, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. And by grace, you have your faith and saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So by, by grace you have been saved through faith. Simple as that. By grace you have been saved by believing, by your belief in that and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, works lest anyone should boast. And we talked about that before. People were able to get to the kingdom of heaven by their works. I'll tell you, it would be an eternity of writing. People giving their testimonies of how they came to be good enough to get to where they are. God has made it so that none of us are righteous and we're all in the same boat. Which I like. I like to go over on even uh, level of love down there. There's no greater or lesser. And even if someone is rich or poor or famous or not famous, we are all the same. We are all on the same level playing field. We are all children of the most high God. And without Christ, we will all perish. 
Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your word, for the richness of, of, of the depth of what you have shown us through your word. The, the fact that everything that we have, everything that we will have, everything that we will receive, all comes from you and by your grace. And it's never earned. It's nothing that we can do to obtain it, to merit it. But by grace we were saved, and by grace we receive your spirit, and by grace we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and by grace we are able to impart your gifts and calling and everything else that people need. For we become your conduits, your vessels of your grace and mercy. Help us, Lord, to, to stay in that place, and not to become distracted by the things of the world which always came nothing in the end. Jesus, in the Amen. Amen.